about Keith Hampton, who is the Community Preservation Coordinator for the Montana State Historic Preservation Office. Um, so she works with local communities to document and preserve their cultural resources. Um, she has many different projects, like many different projects, uh, including um, researching and documenting um, the Montana Historical Society collections associated with African Americans in Montana. Um, but today she'll be focusing on more the military history side of things um, with her talk. They are our B-17s Norton Bombsite Training Facilities in Montana. So welcome Kate Hampton.
Boeing Aircraft Company of Seattle, Washington began construction of a four-engine heavy engine bomber, or heavy bomber. Until maiden flight, the plane was covered in canvas for military security reasons. Newspaper reporters at Boeing Field stood by in awe and amazement as it was unveiled and put through taxi trials, which means it just rolled up and down the air, uh, the runway. No airplane constructed before matched its size and sturdiness. On July 28, 1935, the Model 299 prototype for the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress took off from Boeing's field on her maiden flight. The four-engine behemoth roared down the runway and as it climbed in the air, the rising sun glinted over the Cascade Mountains off of its polished wings. As the mammoth took the air, one reporter described the plane as a veritable flying fortress and the name stuck. The Model 299 flew from Seattle to Wright Field in Dayton, Ohio on August 20th, 1935, with Boeing test pilot Les Cowboy Coward than his at the controls. It covered 21,000 miles in nine hours, maintaining an unprecedented average speed of 232 miles per hour. Flight tests continued under the watchful eye of the Air Corps with great success. Twin engine planes, remember this was a four engine plane, twin engine planes from Martin and Douglas were also in the competition to supply the U.S. war machine, but it was obvious to all that the Flying Fortress would be the ultimate winner. Then tragedy struck. So I do a lot of aviation history um, talks, and lots of people die. It's really depressing. Most of my talks are <laughs> profoundly depressing, including this story, because our dear friend, Cowboy Tower did die um, on August 20th, 1935. Uh, I'm sorry, on um, um, October 30th, 1935. Took off from Dayton's right field for further testing, and as it cleared the ground, it started climbing too steeply. It headed almost straight up, and then one wing fell off. It sliced through the sky, crashed to the ground, killing Les Tower and Major Pete Hill, who was also in the plane. The Air Corps attributed the crash to an engaged dust block. So I had a pilot, so I had to look up and see what a dust block was. And if you think about, it's like a small block or wedge that was used when the ground, aircraft was on the ground to prevent the control surfaces moving in the wind and potentially damaging the aircraft, or even moving the aircraft on the ground. So if you think about all of these flaps and rudders and things on a plane that move independently of the plane structure. They had to put wedges in when the ground, when this enormous wind was on the ground so that the wind didn't push it up and get it moving in the wrong position on the airfield. Well, some of the vessel locks were not disengaged. So because the vessel locks were engaged when the aircraft took off on the test flight, the control surfaces, so the, the rudders, the flaps, so everything that's red and white couldn't move. Essentially, they were flipped, fixed in an approximately neutral position. Imagine if you're camping your steering wheel in your car because someone had put wedges in your front wheels um, to prevent them turning. And it's basically the situation that the pilots were in, but unlike you, they can't just take the brakes when things are going wrong and stop once the aircraft is in the air. So although it wasn't due to any structural or design flaws, but Douglas ended up winning the contract for 113 B-18 bombers. Fortunately for Boeing, all was not lost. The Air Corps, impressed with the B-17, uh, awarded a second contract for 13 of these aircraft that designated the Y-1B-17 and delivered these first production models was between January and August of 1937. By the end of the 1930s, World War II in Europe led the United States to increase its military production. Although the United States officially declared war in December of 1941, of course, Franklin Roosevelt and the Department of War had been preparing for it for many years prior. By the summer of 1940, the Army Air Corps planned for an enormous expansion of combat aircraft training facilities. And by September of 1940, the President's Advisory Commission on the Council of National Defense had begun collecting information about potential sites 
for locating air tra training facilities throughout the country. Construction of the Army Air Force um, training fields and the Army Air Corps became the Army Air Forces in June of 1941. So they're kind of, I cut, sometimes use them interchangeably, but it's the same military organization. Um, they were part of a truly massive construction program on behalf of the U.S. military before and during World War II. Immense facilities sprang up within weeks where none before it existed. These facilities were located all over the United States, thrown in among Army and Navy training facilities, shipyards, jeep, bomber, and tank factories, ammunition plants, ordnance depots, and these training facilities. These facilities were located throughout the central section of the country and were among the most physically large of the World War II facilities, often requiring the requisition of thousands or even tens of thousands of acres um, of agricultural land. And that's what we've got here in Montana, right? So we were very attractive. The immensity and scale of scale and the rapidity of completion of the facilities nationwide is difficult to overstate. All over the nation, land was acquired for the construction of industrial, military, and support facilities, meant to train and arm a vast armed force necessary to fight a land, sea, and air war on two fronts. By 1939, the Army Air Corps had 17 airfields in the United States. There, I'll go back and see the 17 airfields in the United States. By late 1945, the Army Air Corps had nearly 800 airfields in the continent of the United States. World War II was the first time in history that military forces attempted strategic aerial bombing of enemy military and industrial facilities in a significant way. With a few important exceptions, airplanes were largely untested and in some quarters a controversial weapon of war. Much of the controversy over the airplane as a weapon centered on whether or not strategic bombing was an effective means of waging war. I mean, could you really strategic bomb and minimize civilian casualties? And was it really strategic? Were you able to actually put the bombs where you thought the bombs should go? So Four-engine bomber aircraft such as the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress and the consolidated old TV-24 Liberator constituted largely experimental weapon systems prior to World War II. Cutting-edge technologies allowed for behemoths to fly thousands of miles and strike enemy targets with remarkable precision. In 1942, Major General Robert Olds, commanding officer of the 2nd Air Force, laid out the precise purposes of the B-17 bomb squadron training fields, and so I'll quote him. Take men individually trained in the delicate art of bombing, delicate art, it's not funny way to say it, and weld them into a combat team that works as one man. Particular stress is laid on the ability of this united team to take a four-engine bomber to any target within maximum range, day or night, fair weather or foul, over land or sea, bomb the objective successfully, and present the maximum defensive firepower necessary to ward off attacks by the enemy pursuits en route. It's a big job. The B-17 underwent a number of improvements over its 10-year production span. Throughout the war, the B-17 was refined and improved as battle experience showed Boeing designers where improvements could be made. The final B-17 production model, the B-17G, was produced in larger quantities, so there are about 8,680 of these built, than any other previous model, and is considered the definitive flying fort. Air crews like the B-17 for its ability to withstand heavy combat bit damage and still return its crew safely home. Between 1935 and 1945, 12,732 B-17s were produced. Of these aircraft, 4,735 were lost during combat missions. That's a lot. So this slide is really tiny and hard to read, but I'll give you some of the statistics. I just wanted to give you an idea of the massive dimensions of this aircraft. So the plane had a crew of 10 people. It measured 74 feet 4 inches from nose to tail and it had a 103-foot, 10-inch wingspan. It stood 19 feet, 1-inch high, 
Loaded for takeoff, it weighed 54,000 pounds. It could travel up to 300 miles per hour, fly as high as 35,000 feet, and its range averaged 1,850 miles. The plane bo boasted 13 50 caliber machine guns and had a bomb payload of up to 17,600 pounds. This is a fortress in the air. It's just amazing. So one of the fun facts, I always like to throw out a fun fact here or there, uh, about the 50 caliber machine gun. So, you know, part of the crew were the gunners who were sitting on the side of that. So, do you know the popular phrase that the 50 caliber machine gun did? You're nodding, I'll let you answer it. The whole nine yards. Exactly, it was the whole nine yards. So, when you had a 50 caliber machine gun, you had the um, actual ammunition in a long trail, right? A, a fabric trail that worked its way through the machine. And that long trail was nine yards long. And so when you were finished, you had expended the whole nine yards. And that's how that popular phrase has come into our uh, lexicon, which I think is kind of interesting. Fun fact, right? Now, if you don't remember anything else from this talk, you remember the whole nine yards. So now we have a plane, right? Huge plane. We have to figure out how the 17,000 pounds of bombs are going to hit where we want them to go. And that's the job of the bomb site. Developed in the early 1930s by Dutch immigrant Carl Norden, the Norden bomb site was one of the most important secret weapons developed by the United States military. A complicated early computer, it's essentially an analog computer developed in the 1930s. It consisted of a system of gyroscopes, gears, and optics that could, at least theoretically, and this is how they advertised it, place a single bomb in a pickle barrel from 20,000 feet. They'd never accomplished this feat, but it was a nice advertising line. <coughs> the U.S. Navy began tests on the bomb site in 1935. It's 1935. We don't enter the war until 1941, but we knew something was afoot, right? And the U.S. Army contracted to purchase bomb sites at a cost of $1.5 billion from New York City-based Carlisle Norton Company in 1937. The gyroscope stabilized instrument computed drift and dropping angle for bombs after data was entered into the machine, including ground speed, air resistance, and the estimated time of fall of the bombs. Although his wife reputedly called him the merchant of death, isn't that a nice Thing to call your husband. I don't know how happy that marriage was. <laughs> Norton intended the bomb site to allow for precision. The whole idea was minimizing civilian targets and civilian death, right? A high altitude bombing that would inflict maximum damage on military targets with minimum damage to civilians and private property. Let's see how it did. This is an incredibly complicated machine and teenagers have to learn how to use it precisely at one of these training fields here in Montana. An incredibly complicated machine, the complete Norton system consisted of two primary parts, the stabilizer, which is the part on the bottom, and the sight head, which is the part on the top. The stabilizer was gyroscopically leveled platform that gave the sight head a stable base from which to work, and I'll explain this a little bit more in detail. The sight head had to be carefully aligned with the stabilizer in order to ensure that it was looking in the same direction. Got this machine, it looks like this. You have to make sure it's pointing the same direction that the airplane is going, right? You can't have it off. The sight head contained the main operational portions of the bomb set and consisted primarily of three parts. The mechanical analog computer that calculated the endpoint point of the bombs to the aircraft relative to the aircraft as an angle. A small telescope used as a primary sight, cost about $6,000, just the telescope in the top of the bottom site. And the system of electric motors and gyros that moved the telescope so a single point on the ground remains stationary at the site. You know, the plane's moving, it gets closer and closer. You have to have the gears following that site. So here's how it works. I'm not a mathematician. I'm not a pilot, but this is how I understand it. Okay. 
I will see me out is correct me if I'm wrong. So there are three things to consider when you're thinking about the level and direction of an airplane. Right. We need to maintain control of the roll, which is if you think about your um, airplane wings sitting out here, the roll is this way or this way. Right, you need that to be flat. You need to control the elevator, which controls the pitch of the plane. So it's pivoting up, pointing down, or is it level? And then the rudder controls the yaw. So it's one way or this way. <clears throat> All of that has to be synced up while you're trying to bomb something on the ground. And it has to be the same level, yaw, and pitch as the bomb site itself while you're being shot at, flack everywhere, rolling. You've got 10 people on a crew trying to control all of this. You've got pilots, you've got an autopilot, you've got a bombardier. So gyros within the bomb site keep the site mechanism flat, so that top part is flat, and upright to compensate for the plane's roll and pitch so that it can calculate the proper angles from which to drop the bomb. The bottom half of the site contains the gyro that controls the roll, keeping the site flat and parallel to the ground. The gyro and the football are the top part that they could take off and they would put into that bomb site shelter, the vault that we saw in the first picture. That's what they call it. The football, or the upper half, kept the bomb site's pitch straight up and down so that the bomb site itself isn't going like this. It's always looking straight down. Make sense? Now we're going to get really good. I learned this Friday. Because <laughs> I really wanted to know. It's like, okay, I get it, and, and I think I understand it all. But there are essentially three calculations that the bomb site needs to make. The first is the dropping angle. So if you think about a plane flying at a certain altitude, a certain speed, Speed. When they drop a bomb, it takes a while for it to fall to the ground. Correct. So, if you are looking at the airspeed and the time of the fall, you're looking at the whole range, the green part. Okay, if you're thinking of a plane going across and you're flying and you drop the bomb, the plane keeps going. The bomb drops back here. So the distance behind the plane when the bomb strikes is the trail. Okay? Planes fly, fly, drops the bomb here, it takes a while for it to fall, plane keeps going. Your target is at the beginning point of the trail. So this is the actual range. Following kind of? Okay. So that's the first calculation that the bomb site has to make, right? It needs to know, they look through the eyesight, they place the target in the crosshairs and it locks on. The bombardier is seeing the target reflected in a mirror and the mirror changes its angle as the plane approaches the target. Okay. So that's one of the things that we have to figure out is what is that dropping angle, this hypotenuse. I love that word, hypotenuse. <laughs> Sister Elizabeth would be proud. <laughs> okay, so the next thing they have to figure out is um, the crosswind or the drift angle. So wind will blow an airplane off target. So you need to fly the plane into the wind to counteract the drift, or kill the drift, they call it. The angle at which the plane flies into the wind is called the drift angle. Okay. So if you think about it, if you have a plane that's flying along here, the wind keeps pushing it down. If the wind is coming from this direction, it's putting you off. And so you have to turn the airplane so it slightly flies into the wind, just so that you can keep on your track to the target. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Otherwise, you'd be flying, you get pushed down, you'd have to correct every time you fly. So this is 
the drift angle. Then you have to remember that not only does the wind push the airplane, it's going to push the bomb as it flies, as it drops. So the third angle that the Northern Nord Bomb site has to calculate is what we call the cross trip. So where does the plane have to fly into the wind, going like this, in order to compensate for how much the wind is going to push the bomb over before it hits the ground? Really complicated. You need a computer to do this. And so that's what the Northern Bomb site does. It's going to calculate all of these things using all of these knobs and switches that a 19-year-old kid is learning how to use. It's terrifying. But they did it. <clears throat> kind of following me? <laughs> so, the bomb in here uses all these levels and knobs to adjust for all of these three factors. And once the drop angle and the cross tabs, when all of the sight angle and the drop angle match, the machine automatically tells the plane to drop the bombs. Since the Norton was considered a critical wartime instrument, bombardiers took an oath during their training that they would defend in secret with their own life if necessary. In case the bomber plane should make an emergency landing in enemy territory, the bombardier would have to shoot the important parts of the Norton bomb site to disable it. As this method would still leave in a nearly intact apparatus for the enemy, a thermite gun was installed. The heat of the chemical reaction would melt the Norden into a lump of metal. So they didn't want the Germans or the Japanese to get a hold of this cutting edge technology. One serviceman working on a bombsite manufacturing plant in Elmira, New York, wrote to his wife, quote, I'm working out of engineering and troubleshooting the Norden bombsite. Keep this information to yourself about where I'm working and what the part is. I'm on the biggest job I've ever tackled and I want to keep it, so don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably the most famous Norton bomb site of all. It's by Tom Ferriby to drop the first atomic bomb on Hiroshima, August 6, 1945. The site is prom presently installed in the nose of the famous B-29, which is even bigger than the Enola Gay, which resides at the North National Air and Space Museum at Dulles Airport in Washington, D.C. Despite his best intentions, Norton's bomb site was neither very accurate nor discriminating for targets on the ground. Optimum use of the bomb site required a level platform and a constant speed on the part of the airplane. When a bomber was under attack from fighter planes and anti-aircraft fire from the ground, pilots tended to take evasive action, as I would. Um, which meant it was a constantly in flux as to where your plane was, um, what your target angles were, um, because it was constantly changing. In the hazy, cloudy skies of Northern Europe, it really wasn't terribly accurate. But even in the clear, cloudless skies of the American West during training exercises, the Northern bomb site wasn't terribly accurate. Um, but it was better than just eyeballing it and guessing, right? By early 1943, the bomb site was coupling with the B-17 and B-24 bombers and autopilot, and a change in tactics would make the Norton bomb site more effective, but not to the level advocated by its inventor. Despite the problems with the Norton bomb site, it remained in service um, until the end of the war. Variations of the bomb site were used by the military into the Vietnam War. Servicemen experiencing advanced training in the Army Air Force bases had a daunting Consider that in 1941, passenger airlines were in their infancy, and heavier than air powered flight had been invented less than 40 years before. Strategic bombing tactics, including flying in large formations, navigation systems, targeting systems, high altitude survival mechanisms, they're at 35,000 feet. It's freezing. It is freezing. You can't touch any of the metal of the plane, and the plane is all metal. You have to wear silk gloves just to work the instrument or else your fingers would freeze to the metal mechanisms in your 
interest for three. It's terrible. They had to wear pure oxygen, the volunteers in the front. It's just incredible what they went through. Support systems, and of course, simply learning to fly an aircraft as part of a crew were all components of a vast, untested, and unproven strategic combat system. Millions of young men, often with no more than a high school education, trained in this system from 1941 to 1945. And, oh, not many thousands, sorry. Mastered all the new technologies and tactics within a few weeks to perform the most difficult, stressful, and deadly conditions. Within this training system, places like the Army Air Training Youth Facilities in Montana excel and quite literally helped win World War II. Accuracy of the bomb site was solely dependent on the bombardier's ability to set it properly. Some of the information like speed, altitude, temperature, and barometric pressure, and the bomb's curve were calculated ahead of time using mathematical tables. So you had this big booklet that you had to find the precise bomb you were dropping that day, match it to the altitude and the airspeed. It had a number that you put into the computer, the analog computer that is the bomb site, and then from there all of those calculations are made. Some of the information um, were calculated ahead of time, but then again, as the plane approached the target, they'd have to put it in again, right? In the final seconds before the bombs were dropped, the bombardier had to make sure that the bomb site was level, that the plane was headed in the same direction as the site, and final adjustments to synchronize the site with the speed of the plane. One author suggested that the bombardier must, quote, use his fingers as skillfully as though it's playing the violin. The bomb site was connected with an automatic pilot that took control of the plane during the final seconds before the bomb was released. Mm. Here's a crap, oh, a nice look. <coughs> Crouched in the plexiglass nose of the aircraft, so the, the plane's front was all plexiglass and the bombardiers in the very front, looking down. There's nothing but plexiglass and a little rib frame between him and 29,000 feet or whatever height. Bombardiers had the worst seat in the house. Breathing pure oxygen in temperatures 40 below, their ears ringing with thousands of horsepower generated by hundreds of pistons. They had to adjust their bomb sights, wearing silk gloves so their fingers wouldn't freeze to the frigid metal, even as the airplanes flew through flak and withstood attack from enemy fighters. On their shoulders weighed the responsibility for the success of the entire mission. In Montana, I made this map myself. <laughs> Thank you. You're not an artist. Army Air Force training fields are located at Great Falls, which served as the headquarters, Cut Bank, Lewistown, and Glasgow. On August 22nd, 1941, remember August 41, not December 41, Secretary of War Henry L. Stinson and General George C. Marshall landed at the Cut Bank Airport. After encircling the field in company with John S. Libby and members of the local airport commission, the men continued on for a Glacier Park vacation. A month later, U.S. Congress approved the purchase of reservation land by the city of Cuphead. The United States of America at Congress assembled that the Secretary of Interior, under such regulations as he may prescribe, is authorized to sell to the city of Cuphead, Montana, all right, title, and interest of the United States and of certain individual Indians, the Blackfeet tribe of Indians, upon obtaining consent of each individual to such a sale. The city acquired 760 acres of grass and hay fields from the Blackfeet on October 20th, 1941. On December 8th, 1941, Cut Bank offered the airport for any use possible to aid in the war. General Hap Arnold accepted the next day, and the U.S. government set about acquiring additional land around the airport. In two takings, the U.S. seized 931 acres and purchased an additional 15 acres. The project also used 1,934 leased acres and 33 acres in easement. In June 1942, plans were implemented for the construction of the Cut Bank Army Air Force Base. On July 6, 1942, the Second Air Force authorized construction of the Great Falls Army Air Force Base. It would be the main base. The Army assigned, Jenner, assigned Major John L. Eaton Base Commander for all of the Montana bases, but for the most part, he remained in Great Falls. 
Each satellite base had two permanent staff officers to oversee their installations. And the Great Falls Army Air Force Base was designated as the 352nd Squadron and was policed by the 994th Guard Squadron. Basic plans for the air base construction had been previously developed as many such projects were going on through the United States. Plans had been made well before the nation entered the war. Usually just a few changes might be necessary to adapt the different locations to specific assignments. Construction began in July of 1942 of all, in all four of the Montana locations. Captain J.C. G.C. Cooper was in charge of construction and authorized to make any changes to the original plans that he deemed necessary. These changes would invariably benefit or speed the project along and improve the conditions for the flight crew training that was soon to follow. The usual size of the squadrons was expected to be nine B-17s with crew training of 37 officers and 229 enlisted men. One B-17 fit inside the hangar. The others parked outside on hard stands that were set apart far enough that if somebody came and Canada attacked us or if somebody came down and attacked us, that then dropping a bomb would only take out one or two instead of the whole squadron. Hard mm -hmm. stands are absolutely enormous. They're still up there. If you have the boats down there, you can still see them. The usual size of the squadron is 9 B-17s. One B-17 fit inside the hangars and the others parked outside. The officers' quarters were 100 by 20 feet and were to house 16 men, while the enlisted men's quarters were the same size and housed 32 men. The enlisted men's mess could seat up to 500 people. Training combined navigation, bombing, and gunnery practice with familiarizing crews with all aspects of the B-17 each learning the jobs of the other crew members on the plane. They would fly to targets in Montana, Washington, or Minnesota. On June 6, 1943, 39 airplanes of the 568th Bomb Squadron arrived at the East Base in Great Falls and split up and flew to their respective <coughs> satellite fields the following day. Squadron veteran Elmer Rushman remembered his time in on cutback by saying, during the first weeks of training, we were very short of airplanes, but in more time, more arrived, one for each crew. A decision was made for each of the four squadrons to be based at nearby air bases in order to get to know each other on the ground. One squadron stayed in Great Falls, one went to Lewistown, one to Glasgow, and ours was lucky enough to go to Cutbank. <laughs> <laughs> Not all cities and towns treated soldiers with respect, but the people in Montana were very good to us. Our arrival in Cut Bank was on July 26, 1943, and our barracks was next to the large water tower. Go back. There it is. Various phases of training took place here, he says. Flying formation, practice bombings at Big Sandy, gunnery practice, and many other activities. By the middle of August, most of us had returned from our furloughs to our homes. Many of us would never see our homes again. Life at the base continued to improve as our skills at our job fell into a routine and we readied ourselves for the day that we would go into combat. The Cut Bend Army Air Force satellite base was located three miles southwest of town. And if you go into the Cut Bend Airport, it wasn't. Yeah, it's really fantastic. Um, and a lot of these uh, buildings are still standing up. They're not Nord Bombsite 12, but they're. they're um, Hangar is tremendous. It's the biggest one in the state, um, and it was actually built a little bit bigger than the ones of Lewistown and Glasgow because they thought maybe the B-29 might come, and so it had to be about 11 feet taller um, than the other bases to accommodate that large plane. So one of the runways, which runs parallel to U.S. Highway 2, is 8,400 feet long. There's also plentiful room to house and maintain the needed base personnel and flight squadrons that would be arriving before even the base was completed. As I said, here's that cut bank hangar that's still standing. The B-29's tail was nine feet higher than that of the B-17, so they made it 11 feet taller um, than the other uh, hangars. And they recently restored all of the windows. 
Yeah, they got a they got a covered commerce grant. And so all those historic windows have been restored and are still functional in the building. It's really great. And if you look at this, so if you think about how huge the doors must be, the front doors where the plane would go through, they were actually accordion doors. So they would kind of be bifolds and full. And that's what this is. And there's another one on the other side that they would push the door folded into this giant structure to let the plane go in. What do they use it for now, do you think? They do, they, they lots and a little thing <laughs> inside the hangar instead of one giant B-17. But it's still in use as a hangar. Training at B-17, isn't that an exciting picture? <laughs> Training at B-17 bottom squadrons occurred over a three month period. Air crews trained day and night in varying weather conditions and would largely fly six bombing ranges in Montana. Extended flights included training exercises over Washington and Minnesota. Dummy bombs used in the training exercises consisted of sand-filled M38s. Training combined navigation, bombing and gunnery practice, and familiarizing the crews with all aspects of the B-17. The intent of this training was that each crewman learned the responsibility of the other crew members. A spokesman for the Army's Second Air Force said that, quote, the crews at the four Montana fields will be engaged in regular training flights to check on the accuracy of the navigators and to promote teamwork among the crews. Much of their time will be devoted to practice bombing. One person compared flying over central and northeast Montana with its lack of clearly identifiable landmarks to flying over blackout England. In late 1942 and 43, the skies over central and northeastern Montana were filled with B-17s flying between airfields are taking a bombing practice and testing long-range navigation um, skills. I was talking to a gentleman um, in Lewistown who was younger. He was in school when all of this was going on, and he said he remembers being on the playground in Lewistown and having a bomber fly so low that they all, all the kids just hit the deck, and that um, they were afraid that some of the um, grass might catch on fire from all of the um, Stacks, I don't know, something in there. But it was terrifying for not only the crews that were tra training there, but for the little kids. You know, he said they said it was exciting, but it was also a little scary. <laughs> so, so this photo, if you're wondering, is <laughs> really important. It's actually on the national in the National Register of Historic Places. This lovely little field doesn't look like much, does it? So, in 1943. Oh, so this photo is of a 150-acre Lewistown pattern bombing range, plus a buffer zone of about 2,250 surrounding acres. So this is the bombing range that they would practice dropping bombs on, and then they had to have a big buffer zone because they weren't very good at this thing yet. <laughs> so this is what it looked like on the ground. In 1943, the skies above when it rumbled day and night with the sound of B-17 heavy bombing squadrons, which means 15 to 18 planes per squadron flying out of Lewistown, Cape Falls, that thing in Glasgow, in combat formation to drop strings of 100-pound inert dummy bombs. This is what it looks like from above. The circular earthen bombing range is a huge bullseye, 1,000 feet in diameter with five concentric rings spaced 100 meters apart, or feet apart. The individual rings were originally plowed um, 18 to 24 inches wide and 6 to 10 inches deep. The center of the target is a circle, 200 feet in diameter. During the season 1943, the center of the target was marked with a red wooden pyramid, 20 feet square by 20 feet tall. All that remains today of the pyramid are a few scraps of red wooden material strewn across the acreage. The metal fragments scattered across the site are the remains, nose cones, cylinders, tail fins of the countless 100-pound inert bombs dropped um, from the planes. Each inert bomb, about four feet long and eight inches in diameter, was equipped with a spotting charge, a cylinder containing three pounds of gunpowder, and an impact fuse. So when it landed, a little smoke went up, and they knew how close to that red pyramid they had gotten. Besides the Lewis, Lewistown bombing range near Winnet, I know three others, though apparently there were six. 
One was in the southeast corner of Blaine County, which was used for altitude precision bombing. Another in Shoto County, about 20 miles northwest of Carter, was used for bombing at various altitudes. The gunnery range was two miles wide and six miles long, also in Shoto County, north of Fort Benton. And they gave bombing crews practice at ground scraping, so they were practicing just shooting from the side of the plane. Um, silhouette Japanese zero planes ranged in long rows served as targets for the gunners, so they just put the like, cardboard cutouts of all the planes, like a little line, and they would practice shooting from the side of the bomber. The Army Air Force announced in 1942 that air-to-air -air gunnery practice would be afforded by a long range yet to be selected, which permitted the use of sleeve targets to through the air by planes. So they were also flying planes and had a target kind of drawn behind that they would practice shooting at as well. I just love these patches. <laughs> um, in total, four bomb groups completed training in Montana, but only one bomb group at a time trained here. These were the 2nd, the 385th, 390th, and the 401st. Four bomb squadrons were attached to each bomb group. In Montana, a total of 16 bomb squadrons trained at four uh, Army Air Force bases and four bomb squadrons trained at a time. So we had one squadron at each of the um, training slates. Glasgow Army Air Force were the ninth bomb squadron of the second bomb group, the 549th bomb, bomb squadron of the 385th bomb group, and the 568th bomb squadron of the 390th bomb group. How they kept track of all of this, I have absolutely no idea. As a point of interest, the first bomb group to train in Glasgow was sent for duty in North Africa, but all the others went to England. The attrition rate among the B-17 bomb groups was notoriously high, and few who joined lived to see the end of the war. As one example, only a single crew among Glasgow's 568th squadron survived the war. In lives and dollars, it's estimated that 600 men perished just as flight crews, and $20 million in B-17 bombers were lost. As the construction of the air bases progressed in the summer and fall of 1942, the three cities' residents prepared to welcome the airmen to the community. Civic clubs invited officers to come speak with them and offer suggestions, as the community's participation in making life pleasant for the group stationed at the airport was really important to everybody. On October 30th, 1942, Vivian Jeffrey of the Cut Bank Pioneer Press wrote, Soldier boys, this is an informal introduction to our city and an invitation to make yourself at home. Jeffrey emphasized the generosity, patriotism, versatility, and recreation facilities of Cut Bank and offered a wish to make the airmen comfortable. She said, Nearly all of our young men are in service, and many of these are probably lonesome and a little strange in someone else's town. Thus, in a way, we're changing boys for a while. Lieutenant Stanley, who attended both meetings this week, told us something about the things you enjoy doing, and you sound a lot like our boys. If there's something we in Cut Bank can offer you, which will remind you of home and will make your stay more pleasant, be assured that that would make us happy too. By November, Cut Bank's Armistice Day Parade celebrated the base opening and their active plans to furnish the recreation facilities. Money and items were donated, and the Masonic Hall offered its basement as a local USO center. The Blackfeet tribe welcomed the airmen as well, and ushered in several officers as tribal members. The town hosted dances and dinners in town. The local high school team began a friendly rivalry with the soldiers' team on base. For all the attention, the airmen were clearly very grateful, and several aligned themselves with the town more permanently, marrying local ladies. To, quote, to know how well the squadron was received by the people of Cut Bank, one only needs to be reminded of one fact. Over 26 marriages between the men of our squadron and local girls took place. <laughs> At the airport, trainees attended classes, maintained the equipment, and conducted drills and training missions. These efforts were made to provide recreational relief, um, and the airmen had a rigorous schedule and duties. Friday night found a lot of activity here at the base, one man said. It all leads up to Saturday morning inspection of personnel and barracks, 
Each man is responsible for cleaning up around his cot. We all grab mops, brooms, and brushes, and when the smoke clears away, the barracks are spotless. Pity the poor soldier who is caught without a clean shaven face. It's all part of the Army routine. We have a drill into us since the first day we entered service, and it's all part of our day's work. Just a word now about the splendid way you, the people of Cut Bay, have received us. We appreciate it and feel sure that you will be justified in keeping up the good work as long as we come to town and conduct ourselves as Uncle Sam's children should. Private team and subsequent air base reporters continue to provide updates and reports from the local newspaper and publish one of their own dedicated to amusing stories and news at the airport. Extreme climate and enormity of their machines often make for interesting fare. <laughs> he says, the extreme cold at Cut Bank cannot be mentioned too much. <laughs> An area around the water tower had to be roped off for protection against falling ice from the gigantic icicles which formed around the bottom of the tank. <laughs> All the plumbing features in the post froze solid. Snow drifted at times four and five feet high, blocking the roads and runways. One wheel of the aircraft on which Captain Neal was taking off ran into a drift. The plane was turned sideways off the rail runway, forcing Captain Neal to take off cross country through the deep snow. He had a difficult time, but the plane, the plane finally rose safely from the ground. The airmen at Glasgow did not fare better. For the uninitiated, Glasgow is an oasis in northwestern Mon or northeast Montana. An oasis means wet spot. <laughs> Glasgow was superlative in this respect. The working day was hampered by torrential rain and Missouri River mud, and the working night was hampered by internal wetness and distributed over the bar in the Glasgow Hotel, access to which was easily established all through the Burma Road, a handy unmatched thoroughfare over the plains of Montana. All three of Montana's satellite airfields returned to use as municipal airports after the war. Most of the barracks were sold off. You can still kind of see them around every once in a while. But the main infrastructure remained, including the hangars, runways, and various buildings. This is uh, Lewistown Airport. Oh, so the color code is where it is the National Register thing. So when we did the National Register um, document, documentation, we originally just nominated the green part. Airport board boards are nervous of so things that say national in the front of the uh, designation. And when they found out that nothing bad would happen to the National Register that they may agree to let us um, nominate the rest of the facility. And so these pink are the new or newer it's been about since about 2003 that it's been listed now. Um, um, but they include the motor pool, petroleum storage building, which is kind of a, a brick a clay brick structure so that if the petroleum blows up, it won't cause fire. Recreation Hall is there. Um, this is actually the only building that predates World War II at the Lewistown Airport. It's the pre-war hangar. So it was just this um, in 1941. And then 1942, all the rest of this was built. Um, this camouflage building. The camouflage building was cool. It has a series of um, kind of tracks and catwalks along the ceiling, and they practiced camouflaging the B-17. So they would have to throw kind of all of these different um, tarps and kind of things that look like grass over the plane. And so they would go up into the catwalks to look down and see how well they did. Um, and that's still there with all the catwalks. Um, the training building was where they um, actually trained the bomb site. So they climbed up a ladder. They tried to focus the bomb site onto a piece of a little box on the ground kind of thing. Um, and the storage reservoir. So there's a water was up here, the storage reservoir, and the pump house is up here. The pump house, I think, is my favorite. I like the hangers, but the pump house is the sweetest. Because you go in and at Lewis Town, and it's just a tiny little pump house with a couple of built-in cabinets. But you open one of the cabinets, and it was tradition as you graduated from the training school that you wrote your name on the inside of the cabinet. And you can still see all the boys' signatures mm -hmm. in the pump house. So, my favorite part of the airport. So, despite quite a bit of new construction, Lewistown Airfield boasts the greatest number of World War II era resources. 
And again, it's thanks to, to Leroy Music and the many people at the um, airport facility that these buildings not only remain standing, but are now documented and celebrated by the community. This site is a motor pool training building and camouflage building with a crew and with practice covering the planes. The other thing about the camouflage building, Mr. Music did not want me to go into the camp. He was <laughs> adamant that I would not go in lest my delicate female senses be overwhelmed <laughs> because all of the walls still have all the 1940 pinups <laughs> of the ladies in bikinis looking at the planes. He was very embarrassed. <laughs> and uh, Lewistown the Recreation, Recreation Hall now serves, serves as storage, but it's easy to remember and imagine airmen and locals enjoying dances and live music here. The most impressive size-wise is, of course, the hangar. The gorgeous windows, accordion style doors, and a bow truss system that supports its huge roof without interior supports. They now store about 20 planes, that's a good question, in a space that would only hold one B-17. Cutbank's hangar, as I said, is visible from the highway to drive from Valier to Cutbank, which of course we've all done. <laughs> if you haven't, do it now. That's right. And thanks to a recent grant, as I said, they fixed all of its windows, and it's truly an impressive sight. What Cutbank lost, as I mentioned, however, was its northern bombsite vault. Fortunately, those at Glasgow and Lewistown remain. There are only two of three known to be standing in the nation. The other is the Cook, um, at the Cook Airfield in Nebraska. So the bombsite vaults in Lewistown and Glasgow were constructed from standardized plants and are of the same dimensions. Both are poured concrete with walls approximately eight inches thick. They have poured concrete roofs, identical footprints, and surface features. One half of the vaults were used to store the bombsite plant shelving, and the other half of the building may have functioned as equipment storage and repair, but they also housed the soldiers that were defending it as well. The history of the 398 bomb group described the storage vault, quote, in, relative, in the relative secrecy of the bombsite vault, Technicians worked day and night to ensure the accuracy of the group's attacks, so they would also work on them and make sure that they were functioning correctly in that tiny little building. So lucky to have these remarkable properties to experience, and the local entities that manage the airports endeavor to be good stewards of the military history. I was really hoping, um, but then I got really nervous about the roads tonight, and um, Mr. Uh, Noel Camper, Roy Noel Camper, is at the Cutbank Airport. Um, and they have a little museum there about the World War II experiences. And he was going to bring us a bomb site tonight, um, but freezing rain right through the canyon made me nervous. And I said, "You can back out if you want to." So I apologize. It's on me, Mr. Old Camper. I can't do it. Um, but he was very generous. So another excuse to go on a fabulous Montana road trip, right? If you could hit them all. Lewistown Glasgow. Look at all these wonderful features. And they have interpretive interpretation at the Lewistown Airport. There are signs, because uh, it's National Registry District, they have signs in front of every building that describe what's what used to happen in there. Um, and at Cutbank, they, again, Mr. Noel Camper, um, and they always have this wonderful museum um, that has a bomb site. There's also another bomb site, there are two others that I know of in Montana. There's one um, in Lewistown at the uh, County Museum there in Lewistown. If you've ever been there, they have the giant man and the slope in the front, too. Um, and then the other one is at the Computer Museum in Bozeman. Mm -hmm. um, because really, it was one of the earliest computers ever built. So, um, the voices of World War II generations may be fading away, but it should never be forgotten, right? And so thank you so much for letting me talk to you a little bit about If you have questions, I'm going to come to you with yep. the microphone so we can get your voice on our camera recording. Let's see if I can answer them. I heard this Mr. Camera working with you. Deal with the uh, Glasgow. Is that at the regular airfield or is that the Air Force Base for the Northern Town? 
It is the Air Force Base farther north of town. Senior Marine. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. That was a question I could answer. Thank you. All right. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Um, how big were the uh, squadrons and groups in terms of numbers of uh, crews or airplanes? I think there were, I think there were 16, there were 10 people along each group in each plane, and then there were 16 in a group, 16 planes in a group. Did I get right? Hmm? I think you're right, yeah. 16 in a group, four in a squad. Four in a squad. How many mechanics? I don't know the answer to that question. But now I have to find out. <laughs> <laughs> no, lots of mechanics. Right, if you think about there were 226 men being trained, enlisted men being trained at any given time. There's only one group at a time, right, that each of these training facilities. 226 men. There were 16 planes, 10 people playing, 160 of them were then trained to fly, the balance of them were mechanics, cooks, grounds people, all of that. So it was almost as many people as part of the machine of getting these things into the air as it was the people being trained to, to the missions themselves. Yeah. Mm. So I'm gonna go over here first, oh, she has a hand up, and then we'll come back. Sure. <laughs> Do you know if the B-17 was part of the Lend Lease Act, or did, was it only American pilots, or did they lend lease to the That's European? a good question, and I don't wanna, and I wanna say I don't know. I don't think we were sending B-17s through Lend Lease, but I'm not positive about that. When do you go to tour these or go on a road trip to, what's your time? Like well, you're not going to get caught in the muck of a slavery. <laughs> um, but, you know, I would just call ahead. But okay. Mr. No Camper is in, at the company airport almost every day. You know, so you just can go. Just call. You just call. To make call sure they're there. To make sure they're there. Lewistown, you can go and take a self guided tour anytime you want. Okay. It's open, and all of those interpretive signs are right there. Not so sure about Glasgow. They've had some changes up there, and they're doing more Boeing test flights. Um, not military, as far as I know. <laughs> and Boeing, but some of that might be closed off, so you might have a better luck um, at Cut Bank in those towns just for regular hours. Okay. Yeah. So it's well run where they made the most of it. Mm -hmm. Where they made the B 17s? Yeah. The well run out of yeah. Detroit? No, that was B 22s. The Liberators. The Liberators were there, right. They would make that four more. Yeah. The first, I guess. Like, as well. Mm -hmm. as well as <laughs> but the cops for the Nord bomb site were made in all different places. Like the guy from Elmira that didn't want his wife to talk, they only made one small portion. There were thousands of parts and pieces that went into this bomb site, um, and that that were all manufactured in different places and then assembled um, in New York, right, New York City. So Anthony, our wonderful person here, his grandfather worked at the Northern Bond site facility. Who did he run it? Uh, chief inspector. He was chief inspector um, at the New York City factory where they put it all together, which is cool. So he probably knows part of that. Just still like your curiosity. Was the group was here. My father was a CB in the Navy. But how many people in this room have relatives that uh, flew with the B-17 or others that you're aware of? It's kind of interesting to find out about descendants. I mean, ancestors that were involved in the war situation. That might be something you might be interested in too. Okay. <laughs> CDs. <Okay. laughs> Absolutely. That would be a good question. Speaking of trivia, <laughs> the first time I heard about the Northern Bomb site was on a geology field trip to Bracket Creek, which runs um, 
into the Butcher Range and between there and Well South. They mined optical calcite, which was clear enough to be used in the bomb sites. So just another little piece of Montana that went into this. Right. That's right. That is just fascinating. The Strategic Metals Mining Act that kind of took over a whole lot of the development of mines in the 1940s here in Montana. You had the calcite, you had um, strategic mining, of course in Butte, but also in Nyhart um, and Monarch. Those mines kind of started coming back up, and of course the big um, mines all the Columbus and Absorbing kind of all were all part of that strategic. Um, no uranium in Montana. Um, but close by in Wyoming, almost. Um, it's on the border. Um, almost, we can't quite claim <laughs> Other fun things, so the crosshairs, you know, you always hear the word crosshair. And the legend says that the crosshairs within the site, of the bomb site, had to be animal hair because it wouldn't crack or break at those extreme cold temperatures or altitudes. And Norton, Carl Norton was quite the entrepreneur, advertiser, liar. And so he was, he was an, an interesting fellow, but he claimed, and for a little while it was claimed, that a single woman in somewhere in the Midwest had hair that was so ideal <laughs> that it was like every mom's site was made from her flaxen and head. It's <laughs> completely made up. But it's nice. <laughs> I think that is a great spot to leave it. <laughs> 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 